This is a theory about what matter is made of and how it could come to exist. The idea was conceived in its entirety by Douglas C. George of Eureka, California. In 1915, Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity revealed an astonishing fact. Matter and empty space interact. Einstein deduced that physical objects warp space, and the warped space determines the paths taken by freely falling objects. In other words, he figured out that gravitational fields are warpages in the fabric of space itself. Even more surprising, Einstein's theory of gravity showed that any object, if compressed to a small enough size, will collapse under its own weight, crushing itself into nothing more than the extreme warpage of space, known as a black hole. In his 1994 book, Black Holes and Time Warps, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy, physicist Kip Thorne tells us that black holes are made wholly and solely from the warpage of space itself. The cavitation theory of matter takes these ideas further and proposes that all physical objects are made wholly and solely from the warpage of space itself. The central hypothesis of the cavitation theory of matter is that the explosive expansion of the early universe pulled the fabric of space apart, leaving it riddled with vast numbers of subatomic-sized holes, or cavitation bubbles. The sequence shown here roughly depicts such a cavitation process taking place in a two-dimensional slice through the center of the universe. In three dimensions, these holes would be spherical cavities. The cavitation theory of matter proposes that these cavitation bubbles are the basic building blocks of matter. In general relativity, the relationship between a massive object and the warped space around it, its gravitational field, is encoded in the Einstein field equations. Solving these equations for a particular object produces what is known as the metric for the space around that object. The metric, in turn, describes how measurements of time and distance are affected by the warpage. In 1915, Carl Schwarzschild found the metric for a simple, uncharged spherical object, and later, in 1923, the mathematician George David Birkhoff proved that the metric found by Schwarzschild is the general solution for any spherically symmetrical distortion of space. By Birkhoff's theorem, then, the warpage of space around a spherical cavity must be described by the Schwarzschild metric and would therefore be a normal gravitational field. In addition, considering that gravitational fields have mass, because they have energy, a cavity in the fabric of space would have both a gravitational field and a mass, the key ingredients in all physical objects. A cavity in the fabric of space would be, in every possible sense, a physical object, made wholly and solely from the warpage of space itself, just like the black hole described by Kip Thorne. In the cavitation theory of matter, the term warpage takes on a particularly simple meaning. The full Schwarzschild metric is the set of rules for measuring time intervals and distances between events taking place in the warped space around a massive object. The objective of the cavitation theory of matter, however, is simply to describe the static condition of space itself at a given instant of time, a much simpler task and one that requires only a part of the Schwarzschild metric, the part called the radial component. The r in the equation is the distance in any direction from the center of the object, and the dr represents a small segment of that distance. The r sub s is the Schwarzschild radius, also known as the event horizon of a black hole. The radial component describes how the geometry of space changes with the distance from the center of the object, a phenomenon known as metric expansion or metric stretching of space. The small interval, dr, is multiplied by the leading fraction, making the interval larger than it would otherwise be. Note that the metric stretching increases dramatically as you approach the cavity. At the edge of the cavity, at the Schwarzschild radius, the metric expansion becomes infinite. Because of this metric stretching, the volume occupied by, say, one gram of empty space is measured to be larger than it would be in unstretched space. The one gram of space gets spread out over a greater volume, and because of this, its density goes down. Space is thinned out by metric stretching. As the metric stretching increases, the density of space decreases. The two are inversely related. This, then, is the deep meaning of the term warpage. The warpage of space around a massive object is simply the way space thins out in the vicinity of the object. Returning to the image of a cavity, we can now see the details of how the cavity's presence would affect the geometry and the density of space around it. We see that, as you approach the cavity, the density of space drops off from whatever it was far away from the cavity, 
until, at the Schwarzschild radius, it thins out all the way to zero. Space itself ends at the Schwarzschild radius. Since the Schwarzschild metric is also the description of space around a black hole, we can now make two deductions. The first is that the cavities we have been speculating about are subatomic black holes. And the second is that any black hole, no matter what its size, is an actual hole in the fabric of space. General relativity is all about the relationship between matter and space. So inside a cavity, where there is no space, the theory of general relativity simply doesn't apply. The wall of the cavity would be an edge of our universe, the surface where physics as we know it ends. The happy consequence of this is that a cavity in space avoids the entire spectrum of well-known mathematical ill-behavior problems associated with the region inside the event horizon of a black hole. If a black hole is actually a cavity in space, it has no inside and no ill behavior. Its metric would be inherently well-behaved everywhere in space. Beyond this happy consequence, the cavitation theory of matter offers simple, reasonable, and intuitive explanations for a number of current problems in theoretical physics. The following are two noteworthy examples. The volume of a normal object scales with its mass. If you double the weight of water in a container, for example, you double the volume of water. A black hole doesn't follow this rule. Its weight is proportional to its surface area. So, if you double the mass of a black hole, you double its surface area instead of its volume. Current theory fails to account for this. Viewed from the perspective of the cavitation theory of matter, the issue resolves in a simple and intuitive way. If a normal object is constructed something along the lines of the prototype shown here, its mass would equal the sum of the masses of the individual cavities, but its volume would be that of the entire cluster. Its volume would then scale with its mass, as observed for normal objects. If the black hole is, literally, a cavity in space, all there is to it is its surface. It has no enclosed volume and nowhere for the mass of infalling objects to end up, except as part of the surface. If the infalling objects are themselves built out of black holes, as proposed here, the whole process of the growth of the large hole comes down to the simple act of coalescing bubbles, each tiny cavity adding mass to the total in proportion to its own surface area. The growth of the large black hole's mass would then naturally scale with its surface area. For unknown reasons, the expansion of the universe appears to be accelerating. The cavitation theory of matter offers a simple reason for the acceleration. If the universe is not infinite, it would necessarily have an outer surface, where the density of space tapers off to zero, just the way the density of space thins out around an embedded cavity. And for the same reasons, this density gradient would be a gravitational field. The outer boundary of the universe, then, would be the source of a universal gravitational field. Galaxies would accelerate toward the outer boundary, whether or not the universe itself is expanding. The observed rate of expansion would thus be the combined effect of the boundary gravity and the Hubble expansion. The picture of the universe that emerges is both highly simplified and strikingly different. The concept of matter as solid objects embedded in otherwise empty space is discarded and the entire physical reality is seen to be a construct of space itself and nothing more. It's a hollowed out universe, where all of matter and its gravitational fields are reduced to one and the same thing, the localized thinning out of the fabric of space around black holes. In this universe, there are no solid physical objects which generate gravitational fields. There is only the stretched space around holes in space. There is nothing to an uncharged physical object except its gravitational field. The field is the object. Matter doesn't warp space. Matter is warped space. If this theory is correct, the building blocks of the universe could be thought of as literally the edges of the universe. When you touch anything, what you feel are the edges of the universe pushing back.